Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining the Surrey Board of Trade this morning. I'm president of the Surrey Board of Trade. We are Surrey's city building business organization, one of the top 10 largest chambers of commerce boards of trades in Canada. There's 450 of us in our great nation. I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the treaty territory of the Tawasin First Nations and the unceded territory of our Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Kwantlen, Katsi, and Semiamu First Nations. I would also like to acknowledge that we live and work on the land of the Inuit and Métis peoples. Ladies and gentlemen, events at the Surrey Board of Trade simply do not happen without sponsorship support. Thank you to our community sponsor, the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority, our business and international trade center sponsors, the law firm of Faskin, Scotiabank, BDC, the Business Development Bank of Canada, S&F Benefits, the Chambers of Commerce Group Insurance Plan, and Western Community College. Thank you for your support. I'd like to recognize on the Zoom call with us this morning, City of Surrey Councillors Brenda Locke and Linda Annis. Thank you for joining us. Just some instructions before we begin this digital event. All attendees are muted. If you do have a question, please put it in the chat function of the technology and I will get to it during the question period. And if I'm unable to, then we'll get the answer to you after the session is over. One of the things that uh, we want uh, our our great keynote speaker to hear today is Surrey is going to be the largest city in British Columbia. Uh, some are saying by 2030, some are saying by 2040. But Mayor Bowman, uh, we are growing still by, even during the pandemic, by 1,200 people a month. We have the greatest number of manufacturers in British Columbia right here in Surrey. We're a border city. We have an international docking facility where we receive goods from all over the world. Human capital is here. A third of our population is under the age of 19. 40% of our population is under the age of 30. 50% of our population speaks a mother tongue other than English. With the federal government's three-year immigration plan of 600,000 immigrants coming into the country, 400,000 international students coming into the country over the next three years, really to try to address our labor shortage issue, which is a national issue for our business community. Many of those newcomers live and work in Surrey. And that has continued to be the situation uh, that we have even during the Syrian refugee crisis, uh, the Afghan refugees that are coming into the country as well. We have so many economic assets uh, in our great city, but with a growing city, definitely uh, there are some opportunities and we're here to learn from you. Uh, from the great city of Winnipeg, my husband's family actually originally is from the city of Winnipeg, a strong Jewish family. Uh, so I'm so pleased to welcome you to the Surrey Board of Trade uh, in your keynote address in our city leadership series. And uh, just ladies and gentlemen, uh, to let you know, Mayor Brian Bowman is a former business lawyer. He was elected as mayor of Winnipeg in 2014 and again in 2018. He's a forward thinking visionary to unite the city's many diverse communities and cultures, much like Surrey. He has successfully worked to ensure that Winnipeg is a key national voice on racism and inclusion, setting the city on a journey of reconciliation with its Indigenous peoples and adopting the city's first Indigenous accord. He has 
been a committed supporter of Winnipeg's business community, including the city's growing innovation and technology sectors. He has supported annual reductions to the city's business tax system, reduced administrative barriers for businesses, and has worked to build the city's reputation and attract international businesses to Winnipeg. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome His Worship, Brian Bowman. Brian, over to you. Thanks very much, Anita. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Right on. Well, th thank you very much for the invitation to speak to you this morning. And uh, I'm pleased to hear there's a family connection with Winnipeg. I was actually just out in your neck of the woods uh, with the Royal Canadian Navy. I was in uh, North Van and then over to Victoria over the weekend. And just returned back to, to Winnipeg on late Monday. And so um, I appreciate uh, your kind words in the introduction. I really appreciate you've already provided a, a treaty acknowledgement. Um, and uh, I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you here on Treaty One and Dakota Nations territory and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Um, as you mentioned, I'm a, I'm a former chair of the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce. And so I have a personal perspective for the work done by chambers of commerce and boards of trade. And as mayor, I've tried uh, really hard to apply that perspective to the policies that I support here at City Hall. Uh, it's, uh, it's difficult, but it's rewarding work and connecting with member businesses uh, offers, I know, a unique look into the types of challenges faced by businesses on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, I know your local community appreciates your efforts. So I just wanted to offer you a virtual pat on the back for the work that each of you do. Uh, as was mentioned, I was first elected mayor uh, back in 2014, becoming Winnipeg's 43rd mayor and the first Indigenous mayor of a major Canadian city. And then I was re-elected mayor in 2018, increasing my plurality and, and capturing more votes uh, than when I first ran for office, uh, always a good objective for elected folks. Both of my campaigns signaled a shift uh, towards positive forward thinking um, and, uh, and prevent, pre presenting a vision for building a city whose population is on track towards a million people and a vision to unite the city's many uh, diverse communities and cultures. So I was invited to speak to you today on a number of topics, uh, including economic development initiatives, transportation, arts and culture and emergency infrastructure, our city's response to COVID-19 and our city's approach to reconciliation. I'm gonna share with you uh, my perspective on things we're doing that I think are making uh, a difference in Winnipeg and, and may, uh, maybe some of these will provide uh, inspiration to ongoing community building efforts in Surrey. Um, I often say that no one, or in this case, no one municipality has a monopoly on good ideas. So I'm looking forward to learning more about the initiatives in beautiful Surrey. Uh, when I was first elected in 2014, one of the main things I was focused on was increasing the promotion of our city to the world. Uh, I know some of you may think of Winnipeg as cold in the winter and, and full of mosquitoes in the summer. Um, and before 2014, I was getting the sense that there, there really wasn't enough effort being put into promoting our city as a place to visit and to do business. In concert with Economic Development Winnipeg or EDW, uh, the city's lead economic development agency and champion for local growth, I embarked on a number of business delegations to other cities, including Montreal, Edmonton, Atlanta, Minneapolis, even Taiwan. We made a, a number of just like great connections uh, that helped build partnerships and strengthen some of our existing ones. And one of the partnerships I'm particularly proud of was from my trip to Montreal, where we met with officials from Ubisoft. Uh, this ultimately led to a $35 million announcement of a new Ubisoft location here in Winnipeg. Uh, and 100 new jobs. Another highlight of that Montreal trip was a speech that I was fortunate enough to deliver to a room full of chambers of commerce. And much like I'm, I'm having the opportunity right now, I got the chance to share some of what's going on in Winnipeg with a group of, of influential ind individuals uh, that may not have been aware of what we we're doing in Winnipeg. And EDW was such an incredibly important part of that trip. EDW includes Tourism Winnipeg and Yes Winnipeg, which is a, a public and private supported team that actively tries to create jobs and investment here in Winnipeg. A strong complement to the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce. 
I'm very proud of the work that they do. Uh, we're very fortunate to have a team of dedicated individuals who actively put their minds, uh, their energies into economic development in our city. Some of the competitive advantages that EDW and the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce promote uh, are, are low cost, um, low business costs, uh, skilled labor, clean and reliable energy with amongst the lowest electricity rates in North America, uh, competitive corporate taxes, low healthcare premiums, low transportation co costs, the list goes on. Essentially, we, we've got a high quality of life with a low cost of living and a tremendous overall biz, uh, value proposition for businesses as a result. These are the factors EDW and the Chamber of Commerce make sure we know about at City Hall and hope we don't break. Uh, municipalities and mayors like your mayor, Doug McCallum, uh, a member of FCM's Big City Mayor's Caucus, which I also uh, serve on, we have a role to play in economic development. And while provincial and federal governments have more revenue to throw at economic development, cities are charged with building and maintaining the basic building blocks of a strong economy. Roads, water, wastewater, protection services like police and fire, uh, the recreation services that contribute to the health and the well-being of families and communities that all make our economy function. In Winnipeg, we saw the opportunity to improve our focus on the economy and recently created the position of Senior Manager for Economic Development and Policy. And our public service is currently developing an overarching tax increment financing policy for future developments. Uh, this will replace the ad hoc programs that we've had in the past, uh, which have proven to be strong support tools that have helped uh, development uh, greatly in our city. Tax increment financing or TIFs, uh, they're a way for municipalities to offer the municipal taxes generated by a project over a set period of time as an incentive for development. Typically, it also allows municipalities to stipulate certain conditions like ensuring a certain amount of affordable housing is included as part of a development. Against the backdrop of a global pandemic, uh, our short-term economic development focus has shifted to assisting those sectors of our economy that have been hardest hit by the pandemic through the deferral of property and business taxes, uh, economic recovery grants, and other financial supports. Excuse me. But our economic development focus in the long term will continue to be based on ensuring that Winnipeg remains an attractive and a competitive place to live and to do business. And we'll do this at City Hall by ensuring that our property taxes remain competitive and continue to make investments in key public infrastructure and services that will support private sector investment and job growth and enhance our overall quality of life. On a per capita basis, Winnipeg has the lowest property taxes, the lowest utility taxes, and the lowest user fees and charges among other cities. And we see this as a critical value proposition to help not just residents, but also the businesses and, and our business community to thrive. In fact, out of 13 major cities in Canada, Winnipeg had the lowest property tax bill for the average, re average residential homeowner in 2020. So to put this in perspective, in, in order from highest to lowest, the list is Hamilton, Montreal, Ottawa, Toronto, Vancouver, Victoria, Edmonton, Quebec, Regina, Saskatoon, Calgary, Halifax, and then Winnipeg. <clears throat> so let's talk about uh, transportation infrastructure. When surveyed about what issues they care about, Winnipeggers consistently cite infrastructure, no surprise there. After years and years of property tax freezes and cuts by previous councils, Winnipeg's infrastructure needs were growing faster than our ability to pay and complete them. Winnipeggers have long complained about the roads, like Torontonians complain about the Maple Leafs. And it was something I was very focused on changing because transportation infrastructure is vital to any growing city. Our roads, they move people around to get to work, back home safely at the end of the day. They enable our public transit system and support the movement of goods and services and have a direct impact on the views of those who make the choice to visit from other cities. 
Since I was first elected, I, I pledged to dedicate 2.33% annual property tax increases exclusively to road renewal and rapid transit infrastructure. We've accomplished 839 lane kilometers of road renewal with $665.6 million invested from 2015 to 2020. So to put this in perspective for you, this is just short of the driving distance from Surrey to Banff. In 2021, this meant Winnipeg had a total regional and local, local street renewal budget of 152.2 million. Road renewals, they represent almost $13 billion of uh, our city's $30 billion of capital assets. That's almost 42% of what the city must maintain. And it really speaks to the importance of protecting those assets. But it's not just about building more. We also need to build smarter. The University of Manitoba uh, Municipal Infrastructure Research Chair, it's the first of its kind collaboration between government and industry. It's helping us build better and it's helping us to build smarter. The chair's research has helped design stronger roads. It's also helped uh, harmonize municipal and provincial road specifications. And while we know there's, there's always more work to do, uh, we're addressing onerous red tape and frustration of contractors and really just trying to drive efficiency. We also have a road construction working group. This is a collaborative effort uh, with the city and industry that's providing recommendations to improve road construction processes to achieve better, more efficient planning and ultimately value for taxpayers. And it's worked on issues like increasing the use of 24 seven construction, uh, improved communications, which is a huge issue with impacted businesses and residents, and better aligning the tendering practices with our city's new four-year balanced budget process. One of our accomplishments that I'm really proud of is our state-of-the-art transportation management center that crowdsources real-time traffic information to provide better routes for residents to uh, get to their destination by avoiding traffic congestion because we're fixing a lot of roads. It's a city of Winnipeg collaboration with Waze. It's creating real-time traffic information that's ultimately powered by our citizens. Uh, another big part of the city of Winnipeg's transportation infrastructure is of course, Winnipeg Transit, which is our public transit system. We've initiated and we've completed our first bus rapid transit way and are now focusing on the recently approved Winnipeg Transit Master Plan that includes a complete overhaul of our transit route system, plans for future corridors, and a transition to zero emission buses. Simply put, modern cities need a modern public transportation system. In our case, we're trying to move from a transit system developed for our grandparents to one that can be fully utilized now and into the future by their grandkids one that is currently free to ride for kids 11 and, and under. <clears throat> I'm now gonna move on to our arts and our, our cultural infrastructure. In Winnipeg, our arts and our cultural sector, it remains vitally important to building a competitive, prosperous and innovative economy. When you think of Winnipeg, uh, you might think of the first national museum out of our nation's capital region. This is the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. Western Canada's largest winter festival, the Festival de Voyageur, uh, North America's largest uh, folk music festival, the Winnipeg Folk Festival, uh, or Folklorama, the largest and longest running multicultural festival of its kind in the world. It has a direct positive impact on local jobs and businesses. In the pre-pandemic world, it was estimated that our arts and cultural sector had an annual GDP of $1 billion, making up approximately 6% of Winnipeg's workforce. If our artists don't thrive in Winnipeg, we end up borrowing our culture from elsewhere and we end up borrowing our vision of ourselves. And in my view, Winnipeg punches above its weight in this sector. Winnipeg has many artists, uh, musicians and authors that are well known around the world. Uh, people like Burton Cummings and Randy Bachman who formed a band called The Guess Who and put Canadian rock on the map with their smash hits, These Eyes and American Woman. Um, or Richard and Mary Bonnie Castle who founded the Harlequin Romance Publishing Empire in Winnipeg back in 1949. Uh, 
uh, or actor Len Crew from the hit TV series Blue Bloods, or um, actress Mia Vardolos, who went to my high school uh, from my big fat Greek uh, wedding. Because of strong uh, community and political support for the arts, uh, we, we have a number of world-class amenities and festivals. Recently, Time recognized Winnipeg as one of the world's greatest places, in large part because of our vibrant cultural scene. Calme York, our Inuit Art Center at the Winnipeg Art Gallery, is now putting our city on the global map, and it displays the largest public collection of contemporary Inuit art in the entire world. And it opened uh, this year, it's already received international recognition. Time used it on the cover of the World's Greatest Places edition, something we're really proud of. And I'm proud that Winnipeg City Council was the lead level government when we provided $5 million towards building this amenity in the first place. The City of Winnipeg also provides annual grants to the Winnipeg Arts Council in order to provide a number of artists and organizations with reliable funding year after year. Uh, we've just opened the Diversity Gardens at the Leaf at our Assiniboine Park. Uh, which you're going to be hearing a lot more about very soon. It's situated on nearly 30 acres of careful, carefully conceived gardens and green space in Winnipeg's landmark Assiniboine Park and will be a magnificent indoor uh, multi-seasonal attraction and one of the most visually stunning places of its kind in North America. So keep your eyes out for that in the coming months and years. Uh, support was provided by the City of Winnipeg uh, through grants and a loan guarantee. Some of you may have heard um, that Winnipeg is cold and we fully embrace that fact that we are a winter city, something we're really proud of. We're home to the longest skating trail in the world. We have an annual warming hut contest on the trail which draws entries from all around the globe each year. World-class amenities and dynamic cultural offerings, they contribute to a higher quality of life a feature that businesses absolutely take into account when considering where to set up their offices and where they want to invest in. So I'm now going to talk uh, about emergency infrastructure and Winnipeg's COVID-19 response. And I've chosen to, uh, to combine these two because the pandemic has really shown just how clearly uh, and how intertwined they are. The city of Winnipeg has a robust Office of Emergency Management or OEM, which has a dedicated emergency operations center. This office runs point on emergency situations such as extreme heat and cold, uh, storms, uh, flooding, air quality, and wildfires, just to name a few. And I should say we've been watching with great concern uh, for trees and property and of course uh, life in, in BC uh, and of course, uh, the wildfires over the last number of years. Uh, and unfortunately, we've experienced our own loss of trees with an unprecedented weather event that led to the loss of over 30,000 trees on public property. Uh, back in uh, October of 2019, shortly before the pandemic began, Winnipeg was a location of what the media were terming the tree apocalypse or tree mageddon. We experienced a, a fall storm of wet heavy snow that downed uh, trees and power lines uh, all across our city. And as a city that takes great pride in its urban tree canopy, it was a very challenging time uh, that resulted in power loss to homes, a loss of access to many roadways and parks that were forever transformed uh, from the loss of our trees. Our OEM, at the time, they sprang into action and helped coordinate the needs and resources required to get our city through that emergency. And when I got home on the, the first night of the storm, uh, neighbors were out in full force helping each other with shovels, snow blowers, and, and chainsaws. Actually, I had a tree land on my house and neighbors were out with chainsaws at the end of, uh, at the, end of the day helping out. Um, and when we declared a state of emergency, and when the call went out, it, it wasn't just neighbors on our streets helping out. It was our neighboring cities from across Canada uh, that were pitching in too. Uh, we're tremendously grateful for the help we received from places like Calgary, Edmonton, Saskatoon, Regina, uh, and even Toronto. Little did we know that this was really just a warm up for our OEM. And a few short months later, the OEM would be taking a prolonged leadership role as our city, 
province, country, really the entire planet was thrust into an emergency that we're still working our way through. In an emergency that threatens the life of citizens and a threat we can't see, it was a very different type of emergency, but our OEM has and continues to provide solid leadership throughout the pandemic. Part of our effort has been to hold regular press conferences that are live streamed uh, to help get regular updates directly to our citizens. And as I'm sure many of you have experienced in Surrey, uh, it's been a really challenging time when governments have had to demonstrate being nimble and flexible. Some of the ways that the city uh, of Winnipeg responded to this changing and challenging landscape include uh, offering to waive penalties for unpaid property and business taxes for those that need it, providing additional loading zones to help local businesses offering curbside pickups and one hour free parking in our downtown, uh, relaxing residential parking enforcement, uh, given that many have been working remotely from home, uh, introducing a COVID-19 economic uh, support grant for small businesses and not-for-profit organizations that have been forced uh, to prohibit access to their premises due to COVID-19 provincial public health restrictions. Uh, raising the small business tax credit threshold, uh, which has eliminated the small business tax for 1,000 more businesses in 2021, saving these businesses an average of just under $2,000 in 2021 and beyond. Uh, introducing a temporary patio permitting program. We're gonna have a winter patio pro programming so you can come and have an outdoor drink in February in Winnipeg, and I would invite you to come out and do that. Um, supporting provincial enforcement efforts of provincial public health orders. Um, recently, our, our provincial government introduced a testing program for all of their frontline staff with the ability to opt out with proof of vaccination. And similarly, uh, the city of Winnipeg followed in this direction, and we're in the process of creating a program that will require frontline staff to be fully vaccinated by November 15th, or be regularly tested for COVID-19. At last week's meeting of council, we also ensured this would apply to members of council so that we're leading by example. Uh, we know, and I'm certainly um, communicating this to our residents that vaccines are our way out of this to the other side. Uh, we're already seeing the benefits here in our community. So the last topic I'll be discussing uh, today is on our city's approach to reconciliation, a topic very near and dear to my heart. Uh, the day after our council meeting last week uh, was the first ever National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, a day that we chose to recognize by closing city facilities, lowering our flags to half mast on all civic buildings, lighting the Winnipeg sign orange, and encouraging our employees to reflect on how they can contribute uh, to reconciliation efforts. When I was sworn in as mayor in 2014, uh, I was the first mayor in the city's history to use a treaty acknowledgement. And I'm proud to say this has really become almost commonplace in our city today at meetings and events. I was really pleased to hear your acknowledgement at the beginning of the event. Uh, as the city's first Indigenous mayor, I thought the time had come to do things differently. And that started with honoring Indigenous experience, culture, and history. It started with acknowledging the nations who give us our foundation as a community. As we've moved forward from that day, I'm proud of the steps we've led on to move the ball forward. Things uh, like embarking on our year of reconciliation back in 2016, creating the mayor's indigenous advisory circle to ensure I'm receiving regular input from uh, leaders in our indigenous community, initiating the Winnipeg Indigenous Accord, which is a document that people and organizations sign on to and commit to respond to the TRC's calls to action and the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls calls for justice, uh, teaching the impact of residential school systems throughout uh, training for all of our civic employees, uh, creating and implementing the welcoming Winnipeg renaming framework. This policy was developed to guide the city in making decisions proactively to rectify the absence of Indigenous perspectives experiences and contributions in the stories remembered and commemorated in our historical markers and place names in Winnipeg. And finally, finally uh, we recently raised the flags of Treaty 1, the Dakota Nations and the Métis Nation at Winnipeg City Hall, which will fly there permanently alongside the flags of Winnipeg, Manitoba and Canada. This discussion is important because names and symbols matter. 
And it's just as important that we lift up hopeful names, hopeful symbols, the kind of symbols that we're embracing today and we want and need to share with the world. Ultimately, I see reconciliation through a lens of human rights. After all, we are the city of the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. And we have a, a human rights committee of council, to our knowledge, a first of its kind in the entire country. Uh, we have the largest Indigenous community in all of Canada, and it's growing. And we want to ensure Winnipeg is a welcoming city that ensures that no Winnipegger is left behind. A Winnipegger is a Winnipegger is a Winnipegger. There is no doubt we've made uh, some great progress, but we know there's still much more work to do. What I'll say is how Canadians respond or not to the TRC's calls to actions will define our generation. Winnipeg's answering that call, and I know others across our country, including in Surrey, are answering that call as well. And I thank you for that. And thank you very much for inviting me once again uh, to speak to you today. Thanks, merci and miigwech. Thank you so much, Mayor. And um, I'm so glad that you were actually in North Vancouver. I'm an honorary captain of the Royal Canadian Navy. I was uh, visiting the Arctic ship uh, as well. So uh, just amazing for uh, the Navy. Thank you for visiting. My pleasure. That, that's great. I mean, that one of the things that, that our Canadian forces, our Canadian armed forces provide, including the Navy, is that connection between Canadians and Canadian communities. So uh, I didn't know that. That's great to hear, Anita. So I have a variety of questions for you. I just ask you to respond to them succinctly. Uh, there's a, a lot of them from our attendees. Uh, number one is uh, we do have a Surrey company. They expanded uh, in Surrey uh, a couple of years ago, and they want to expand across Canada. Their next target city is in Winnipeg. Who should they be talking to? They can call me as soon as we're done. Uh, but the other organization would be Yes Winnipeg. Um, this was a, a group that we, we actually, when I was on the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce Board, so I'm a former chair, uh, we, we then called it Selling Winnipeg to the World, but we recognized governments, uh, they're not good at everything. And, and we thought private sector needed a greater voice in, uh, in having really uh, candid discussions, providing good information to uh, prospective investors in our community. And yes, Winnipeg has evolved into uh, private sector supported. So the private sector sees the value in what they're doing and continues to support it each year. But the, the professionals at Yes Winnipeg are, are a great place uh, to connect. And then, of course, our office anytime for, for that or any other topic we've touched on today. And the attendee also hopes that uh, you will be part of their ribbon cutting in Winnipeg when they open. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not running again, so you've got a year to do it. So let's do it while I'm here. <laughs> but, yeah, um, another question is, uh, you know, Surrey, you can fit the cities of Vancouver, Richmond, Burnaby into the geography of our city. But Winnipeg is even larger than Surrey. How do you make sure that the city is connected and you have diverse uh, communities, very multicultural? How do you uh, make sure that city is connected? Yeah, it's a great question because I've been to Surrey. I, I really love Surrey. I love how multicultural Surrey is and I recognize how fast it's growing. So I, I appreciated that the, the preamble um, and your mayor has, has bent my ear on many occasions about some of the challenges that come with a growing city that we, we face here as well. One of the, the differences with Winnipeg, uh, unlike many other ca Canadian cities is we're, we're not landlocked. I mean, we've got prairies, you know, we, we could just keep sprawling out. And so uh, we've largely been doing that. We've been kind of growing out. And so we've historically been a very car centric city. Um, we've really put a greater emphasis on public transportation uh, as well as active, active transportation. Uh, but building those connections between our people is something that we do very well because while we think, you know, geographically we're in the longitudinal center of the country and we feel that we're a good connection between East and West and we've got the connections to the North. Um, we're kind of in the middle of nowhere in some ways geographically, like there isn't another major big city for, for a pretty far distance. So we've kind of got this, we got to look after each other mentality within the city. Um, uh, sometimes people outside Winnipeg will call it perimeteritis because we have the perimeter highway that goes around our city. So those connections are, are often made by cultural events, uh, Folklorama I mentioned and other things 
Um, all of those events that bring people together, and that's been the challenge over the last year and a half, is that you know we've all had to um, to do things virtually. So I think we're all really looking forward to when we can gather in greater numbers, uh, you know, it, physically together. So we know that uh, being a politician at any level is always challenging. There's so many different items that you have to deal with. But how do you deal with um, organizations or people that may disagree with your priorities? Do you still talk to them or or not? Well, uh, everybody in Winnipeg agrees with everything I'm saying uh, and doing. Um, no, you're, you're, you're right. Jokes aside, I mean, I mean, that's kind of comes with the turf of being a municipal leader. I mean, you, you don't have a, we don't have a party system here. So, um, you know, I've, I've got a, a cabinet that has conservatives, liberals, NDP, and a few people I haven't, I haven't got a clue what their political, like partisan political allegiances are. And so, you know, at City Hall, we, we really only get things done through partnerships, uh, both with, between members of council, but also because we, you know, the, the running joke at the municipal level, of course, is, you know, the federal government has all the money, provincial has all the power, but, um, but, but municipal leaders actually get the work done. And I, I think, you know, that's stretching it a little, but one of the ways that we get things done is, is by partnerships. And so I think you, you, you really do need thick skin to be in municipal government, to be in modern politics these days, you need thick skin. Um, I think if you just keep elevating the discussions to what's in the public interest, uh, then it doesn't personalize things and you can make sure that you're learning from your critics. Um, I, I mean, social media is a great example. I, I do look at the comments uh, and, and even the trolls uh, because often they will point out um, uh, things that you, you might not be doing well uh, or you need to better communicate. Uh, so it doesn't mean you always agree with them, but uh, I think the more successful public figures are ones that, um, that really keep an open mind. Uh, and, and just like business leaders, you, you got to constantly be looking for ways that you can become more effective. Every year we present uh, to the city of Surrey, to their mayor and council as part of our mandate uh, on their city budget, as we do with all levels of government. I'm sure the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce does as well. Tell us about your city budget and uh, how you're prioritizing uh, investments uh, for the community, uh, for the private sector. Uh, you mentioned a little bit about reducing taxes, but um, just tell us a little bit about uh, the flexibility in realigning priorities uh, for socioeconomic circumstances as it relates to your city budget. Yeah, that's a pretty broad question. I'll, I'll try to be as succinct as I can. I mean, one of the things that we've done recently is we've, we've moved to a four-year uh, balanced budget. So um, this was done, uh, we're now in, in the, the, the second last year of implementing that, that balanced budget. And so we have annual budget updates or, or annual balanced budget updates. Uh, that was really important for, for getting City Hall to think more strategically. So not just on kind of that ad hoc political annual basis, um, and I think in the long run, it'll really help shift the thinking at City Hall. Uh, the, our Chamber of Commerce is invaluable in their input into that, that process. I find they're more effective when, and this goes for any group, when they can try to align their lobbying efforts with the strategic direction of the city. So when I was elected, I really tried to focus on, uh, let's grow our city to a million people and start making decisions for a million people. And so the year before I was elected, our, our population was uh, 698,000. Uh, we're now pushing 800,000. The last count was around 780,000 within the city of Winnipeg. That's not including the capital region. And, um, you know, kind of thinking more strategically, the pandemic has forced us all to be more nimble and innovative in real time. And, and there's, there's lessons that I think all municipal governments, all governments can learn out of this in terms of how you have more real time dialogue uh, outside the budget window with groups like Trades of Commerce and Boards of Trade and, and Chambers of Commerce um, on how we can pivot in terms of, of making sure our business community is as successful as possible. And, and in some ways, it's just getting out of the way. Um, I mean, that's where reducing red tape, creating efficiencies, that's essentially just get out of the way and let business do what business is good at. Um, I mean, in many ways, we try to focus on the core. You know, I mentioned roads because it's 
it's a core asset. We, we haven't managed it historically very well in Winnipeg. And so uh, one of the simplest things we're doing, it's no small feat, is just fix the roads so that trade and commerce and residents can get around more safely and efficiently. Um, but, you know, you know, that being said, reconciliation and human rights isn't historically uh, a municipal uh, thing that you would hear about, but at the municipal level, we're on the ground and we're seeing municipal leaders, I think, answer the call to the TRCs very well um, as, as a level of government. How have the city of Winnipeg uh, worked with the university um, as part of an economic development partner? You know, uh, the probably the best example I would say is that that municipal research uh, or municipal infrastructure research chair. And so we, we heard from groups like the Construction Association, um, our Heavy Construction Association, um, many other groups who were long complaining about the state of infrastructure, who were long complaining about how we built roads, for instance, uh, that took too long, they weren't using the best products, and, and that just, it could be done a lot smarter. And so um, we partnered with, this was a campaign commitment of mine when I first ran is basically we said we were going to partner with the University of Manitoba to create this, this research chair. In Winnipeg, a lot of Winnipeggers will go down to like Grand Forks or Fargo and they'll see the roads on the interstate and they'll compare it to, to Winnipeg and say, well, they seem smoother down there. So what we did is we said, well, let's, let's tap into the research. We don't have to develop the same research tools here. If we can tap into uh, to the university uh, to get their wisdom, let's do that. And industry answered the call and they stepped up to fund it. And our provincial government, to their credit, stepped up in a significant way to, to help. So we're kind of all pooling our efforts now. And then we're deriving that research um, uh, out of the, the university. The other is I meet quarterly with the presidents of all of our colleges and our universities, um, like, like the University of Manitoba, the University of Winnipeg. Uh, Red River College. Uh, we have many other smaller uh, colleges and universities, um, but I meet quarterly with them because much of what I try to do is to, to support their efforts, to amplify, uh, you know, the benefit of the research dollars that are coming in, uh, connections with their alumni that are in our community and that are abroad. Um, you know, the, the mayors have that power to convene and the visibility of an office of the mayor. And so I try to be a community champion for them here and, and, and abroad. Tell me about your perspective on international investment attraction. Have you used uh, foreign trade zones or free trade zones within your city uh, as uh, temporary tax incentive measures or tax reduction measures uh, for you know, short-term pain for long-term gain? Uh, tell us your perspective about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was hoping to do a lot more international travel in this, in this term. And unfortunately, I haven't been able to do that because of the pandemic. But yeah, I mean, we're, we're you know, I think Canadians often think that they're competing against other, other Canadian cities or even their neighbors. Uh, I know probably in the lower mainland, you get the competition, the friendly competition as well. And, but in many ways, Canadian cities are in, are in a global competition for talent. And so you know, I mentioned Ubisoft, but we, we've got many other examples of, of uh, ICT uh, industries that are investing here. And they're really trying to attract uh, skilled labor force from places like Chile and Argentina and India and, you know, Europe. I mean, uh, so I think recognizing the global markets are, you know, we're in a global competition for talent and for investment. Um, to answer your question, we, we have fortunately in Winnipeg Centreport. Uh, Centerport is a, is a very unique inland port that leverages our transportation infrastructure. We've got, you know, um, one of the largest aerospace sector uh, economies here in Winnipeg in Canada. Um, we've got uh, multimodal uh, access in, uh, in Centerport. And so we've worked really hard to support Centerport's um, efforts as well as EDW, so Economic Development Winnipeg. In, uh, in really trying to go out and, and compete with the world. Um, and uh, I think Canadians by and large, certainly Winnipeggers are guilty of this. We're, we're very modest. We don't, we don't pound our chest very well. And so, you know, often, uh, you know, we're very, you know, we, we will we'll say sorry for saying sorry, you know, <laughs> like we, we don't get out there and say, you know what, Canada rocks. Winnipeg in our case, is, you know, rocks is a great place to invest and, and to have a high quality of life. 
Surrey can make that case as well, and I know does. Um, and Canadian cities are, I think, increasingly uh, having a bit more swagger because we know that we can compete globally and, and succeed. Tell me about your housing priorities, your relationship with developers and not-for-profit developers. Yeah, I mean, that's where, I mean, in many ways where the rubber hits the road at, at city halls. I mean, land use planning is, is a big part of our, of our work. Um, we have continued to, to grow out, but I'm, I've tried to get us to also grow up in terms of our density and, and we're doing that. Um, we're one of the last major cities in Canada to have uh, growth or impact fees, as we call them here, uh, something that I've, I've really had to get my elbows up to make sure that we have a recognized ability uh, to charge an impact fee so that we can make sure that the costs of growth are better paying for, for that growth. And, and that work continues. But the, the, um, the housing situation is a little bit different in Manitoba. Um, uh, the provincial government in our case is responsible for housing. Uh, we've really tried to leverage TIFs in order to incentivize um, different, different things that we want to see on the housing spectrum where we know there's an acute need. And so affordable housing is, is one uh, area where we've, we've increasingly tried to, uh, to influence, to increase um, and provide some, some relief on that spectrum of housing needs in our community. I don't think it's quite as acute as we see in places like Toronto and Vancouver. Um, I know that that you know some of the some of the needs in the housing sector and the costs are are um, are way more acute, but we're starting to to face them here. And I think what we when I look at some of the other um, larger centers, I think it may be a precursor to some of the acute needs uh, that we're going to see in the coming years. And so we're trying to get ahead of that by developing policy that's uh, more long term focused. What are some of the initiatives uh, that you have implemented? for homeless uh, solutions, poverty reduction? Yeah, right now we're, we're actually working on a poverty reduction strategy. Um, one of my first motions that I brought to council when I was elected was to support an initiative and now an organization called End Homelessness Winnipeg. Uh, this is a housing first initiative that brings together uh, all three, actually four levels of government, if you include our indigenous community partners. Um, and so it, it's something that has as a stated goal, not to reduce homelessness, but to eliminate it. And so um, that work continues, um, you know, in a country as, as wealthy as Canada, uh, the number of, of, of folks that are affected by homelessness is really um, embarrassing. Um, you know, we're a wealthy country. Uh, we got smart, talented people. Um, but, you know, we know that the, the, the challenges um, that that are affecting many of our residents are are complex. Um, there's a kind of that intersectionality with uh, mental health addictions in some cases. And um, while you know, in our case, you know, our provincial government is responsible for housing, social services, and healthcare, we still have a role to play. And so we continue to look for ways that we can leverage limited dollars, uh, limited jurisdictional responsibility in a way that brings brings together people so that we can affect the outcomes that I know we all want to see. What public safety crime reduction innovations have taken place in your city? Well, in terms of crime, uh, crime reduction, um, I mean, we have a police services act and a police board. And so we, we can't directly uh, affect uh, the operations of the police service. But what we've increasingly been doing uh, here in Winnipeg is really trying to look at the root causes of crime and try to see if there's ways that we can make investments that reduce the demand on calls for service to the police. And so I was, I was fortunate enough to be um, invited by um, uh, Michael Bloomberg to join the, the Bloomberg Harvard Initiative. We, we focused on uh, uh, an effort where uh, we've really focused on, on how do we, how do we, reduce the demands on calls to service to 911. So we're working with, uh, with around 30 different groups in our community, including provincial agencies on how we affect that. And that's kind of the, the, the focus is, if we, can, if we can make sure that the right resources are deployed at the right time by the right agency, we're gonna reduce uh, the, uh, obviously in the long run, we hope it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna be um, a more efficient use of tax dollars. But more importantly, it's just going to make sure that um, you know our vulnerable residents, residents that need the supports, are getting the support at the right time. And so, 
not an easy one uh, to deal with, but um, that that's those are a couple examples of how we're trying to deal with them. My last question to you is um, the new cabinet for the Canadian government is going to be announced shortly. Uh, you're the mayor of a, a major city in Canada. What do you want out of uh, the next session um, of the, the federal government? The relationship that, um, that Prime Minister Trudeau has had with the big city mayors has actually been pretty good. Um, you know, he's been accessible and the cabinet ministers have been accessible as well. Um, the, the biggest challenge we have is, uh, you know, they have been spending money on municipalities, which I mean, for municipal leaders is, is welcome news, especially on infrastructure. We often have a log jam at our provincial legislature. So um, as an example, we've got hundreds of millions of dollars that have been set aside in Ottawa for Winnipeg Transit. And we haven't been successful at even getting our provincial government to send the request to Ottawa. Um, and so it's, it's frustrating. And so where we can, where we can work uh, collaboratively with uh, federal government to affect our provincial government, um, ending some of those log jams, we're going to be able to deliver those dollars here in, uh, in Winnipeg. And so, um, you know, I know that the federal government has to think about how they're going to deal with the, provi the provinces uh, kind of on a national basis. But um, when they don't get their elbows up and ensure that those dollars are flowing, um, you know, it, it, it affects us here in, in Winnipeg. And we know that those dollars have been flowing in other provinces, um, you know, very well, especially when it comes to public transportation. We've got the North End Sewage Treatment Plant upgrades that we're working on. It's nearly a $2 billion project and uh, is something that we've led on to try to better clean up Lake Winnipeg. This is the seventh largest freshwater lake in the world and a, and a beautiful asset for, uh, for Manitobans and Canadians. Um, but it's not a healthy lake right now and it needs a cleanup. And so Winnipeg contributes about 5% of the nutrient loading uh, to that lake. Um, we need, you know, it's, it's still 5% and that those upgrades are important and we continue to press provincial and federal governments to do more for the other 95%. So those are some of the things we're looking for. Of course, housing, reconciliation, human rights work, uh, infrastructure investments will be looking to, to affect and with, with the new cabinet. Mayor Bowman, any other closing remarks before we adjourn? You know what, just, I, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to join you. I, I wanna recognize a couple of the counselors I know that are attending. And uh, you know, if, um, if there's ever anything I can do to expand on any of these topics um, with any of our friends in Surrey, or there's things that we touched on where you're like, you know, I think, think Winnipeg could learn about some of the good things that we're doing. Your, your mayor is very, he, he will bend my ear uh, to let me know the good things that are happening in Surrey, which I always welcome. Um, but I, I just in particular wanna invite everybody on the call to, to visit Winnipeg when it's safe uh, and you're comfortable in doing so. Um, you know, Winnipeg has changed. If you haven't been to Winnipeg in the last five years, you haven't been to Winnipeg because it's really changed a lot. And uh, it's a great place to visit. I, I jokingly always say February is a great time to come here. Uh, but it's our second busiest tourism season because, you know, one of the things that I often say is uh, summer across Canada is beautiful everywhere, I think. Um, but if you want to experience real winter and real winter amenities, one of the places you can visit is Winnipeg. Um, and I look forward to getting out to Surrey um, as soon as I'm able to do so, because every time I've been there, I've really enjoyed it. The people are great and uh, want to wish you all the very best during the pandemic and beyond. Mayor Bowman, thank you for joining the Surrey Board of Trade this morning. And thank you for your partnership also with the Board of Trade and Chamber of Commerce Industry uh, previously as well. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you to the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority for your sponsorship. We have many programs, many events upcoming into this year. Check us out at businessinsurrey.com. And don't forget about the October 12th Surrey Art and Business Awards. Thank you so much. Make it a great business day.